Good morning, God's people. I invite you to stand on your feet or sit down if you like. However, the Spirit of the Lord moves you, whatever posture that you want to take before God, just know that He's here and He's available. We thank you, Lord, for your presence. We welcome your spirit to have its way in this place. We thank you for the people that are online, that they're experiencing you and your holy presence at the very same time as we are because you are omnipresent. You are here, you are there with them, and then you live inside of us. So we just thank you. We give you all glory for who you are, God. Let's worship him together. Come on, put your hands together. The spirit is moving over the water, spirit can move over us. Come rest on us, come rest on us. As the spirit is moving over the water, spirit can move over us. Come rest on us, come rest on us. my heart pound when you feel the room you're here and i know you're moving i'm here and i know you'll feel me come down spirit when you move you make my heart pound when you feel the room
desires for your desires, God. Place them in our heart, God. We surrender to you all that we are, all that we have. We are nothing without you, and we would have nothing without you. So we come giving what's already yours back to you. Praise you, Lord. Held us while you need us. Take me there, take me there. What you need is just an offering. It's right here, my life is here. I'll be a living sacrifice for you. You were fire, the refiner. I want to be. I want to be
my heart I want to burn for you Only for you Take my life As a sacrifice Cause I want to burn for you Only important that the bases are good the bases are clear the Lord asked the prophet Jeremiah he said to rise and go down to the potter's house and there you will hear my words so he went down to the potter's house and there he saw the potter working at his will and the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter in the potter's hand and he reworked it into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to do so. Then the word of the Lord came to the prophet Jeremiah and said, O Israel, can I not do with you as the potter has done? As we ask for growth, it's important to bring all ourselves. If we grow and we grow the one way, it's not, it's not good. So this morning we're going to bring ourselves, we're going to bring everything, we bring work, we bring we bring, we bring our misery, we bring what is good, what is bad. We bring everything to the Lord. And we're going to ask Him to mold us. We're going to ask Him to refine us the same way that they purify gold. We're going to sing this one again. Clean my hands, purify my heart. I want to burn for you. Only for you Take my life Give it all, give it all As a sacrifice I want to burn for you
thank you for allowing us to be together today. We thank you for allowing us to share this moment. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. But if we bring it all to you, if we bring everything to you, we know that you can change us, you can mold us into what you would like us to be. Oh, Father, we thank you for this moment for everyone that is here. We thank you for the ones that are online, Father God. We can't thank you enough for what you've done. But we thank you for what you are going to do. During this week, the changes that you're going to, we are going to observe, Father God. Whether it's at work, whether it's in your house, we thank you for everything you have already done for us. Everything you have prepared for us, we thank you, Father God. Father God, open our heart, open our spirit. Allow us to receive this message. Allow us to receive your bread, Father God. For us to make the change that you want it to do in our life, Father. We're not praying it because we're worthy of anything. But in the name of Jesus, your son died on the cross for us. Amen. Now Pastor Fred will be coming to you. Welcome him. As I about take the music, uh, the instruments down with me on the way out, it's a good day. Welcome, those of you watching online, uh, those of you here, it's good to see each and every one of you. Uh, thanks for being part of the service this morning. Uh, before we dive into God's Word this morning, just a couple quick things I want to give you an update. Um, if you are here in the service, you probably got a bulletin. Some of these things will be in there. If you're watching online, of course, you can go into our events, our area, and you can find those information. But just to give you a quick refresh on, of course, our Celebrate Recovery that's happening this Thursday. We encourage you to be a part of that. Come on out. And if you need more information, that's all in your bulletin or online. Uh, that's the Thursday at 730. Uh, we are having our FMO breakfast uh, for all the guys on the 26th of March, 10 a.m. If you haven't registered, please do that. Otherwise, they will not have any eggs, bacon, and, and whatever else they have and all this stuff. Uh, you're going to miss out on it. So make sure you make, it's going to be a great time. So guys, make sure you come out and be a part of that. Um, also, our WOW Women of... of um, Worth, worth. I, you know, we always joke about it. It's women of all kind of W, worth, words, and all that kind of things. So wow, ministry is taking place. Um, we have our um, uh, son, so Weekend in the Sun. I guess I should read what I got here. It'd be good, right? Let's just read it, actually. Weekend in the Sun retreat that's taking place on January 22nd. Um, of course, that seems like it's so far away. 
uh, but it's not because it's going to be there soon. But what we want to just encourage you, um, for those of you that need a particular bathroom, a particular room, or a particular, particular, whatever, you better register today. It opens up today at 5. So make sure that you're here. Uh, make sure you go online, check it out, sign up for it, be a part of that. Um, and this way you can, you can, that's what I like to do. I like to get in there, pick what I want, okay? I don't, I don't want the scraps, okay? I want to pick what I want where I want to be. So uh, I won't be there. It's for the ladies, so, you know, but anyways. Um, and then uh, what was the other thing we had? Okay, yes, great news. We're excited about it. Two things we have. Um, we, you know, have been, it's been challenging with COVID about us being able to go to the theater. We've had to do multiple services for Christmas and Easter. Well, just this week, I believe it was Thursday, we got the approval that we can go and have our Easter services at the Union County uh, Performing Arts Center. So that will take place. So we'll have, we'll have uh, just on that Sunday, we'll have our service there. We're excited about it. Instead of doing four or five over a weekend, our teams are definitely excited about that. Um, but it's going to be a great time. We'll have more information about that. Being we just found out about it, we'll get that in play for you. And then last but not least, uh, our outreach ministry. I love the fact that our outreach ministry is looking for uh, just numerous ways to be able to reach out and touch people in just the challenging times. We are in challenging times, as we know, um, but to really help bless people and meet the needs where they are. Uh, we have one coming up that's taking place on April 9th. Um, it's uh, from 10 a.m. to 1. They're needing 25, uh, yeah, 25 volunteers. And what we're doing, they're going to a couple laundromats that are pre-assigned, and we just want to bless people, to tell them that Jesus loves them and pay for their laundry. That's not for you to go. Don't, don't you, you know, no, that's uh, no. Everybody's like, I'll bring my laundry down there. Okay, but we want to we want to reach out to people because you know this, there are people that are really really struggling, and you know, and be able to be able to put some, you know, the light of, of Christ in their life in the midst of difficult and challenging times. And um, it's going to be a, a really cool outreach. It's a different outreach than we've ever done. I know other people that have done them before, and the doors it opens up to be able to be a blessing to people are incredible. And so that's going to take place. If you'd like to find out more information on that, you can stop by our Blue Room or those of you online, you can check out um, our events page. It'll give you all the information on those things like that so that you can get plugged into that. So anyways, enough of all Pastor Fred's commercial announcements. Um, we put that away. I'm going to dive right into the word this morning. I'm just going to kind of tell you right off the bat, um, for those of you, I know I'm, a, I'm kind of one of those persons when someone's teaching, I like point one, point two, point three. I, I learned that way. I've, I've always, I like, to me, I just kind of like stuff like that because I can just go back to it. So any of you that you need a point one, two or three, you will be highly disappointed today because I have no points. For me, it's stepping out of my comfort zone because I don't usually do that that much. But um, a few weeks ago in, in the Anchored series that we were talking about, there's a, there's a verse that I used. And I just couldn't shake that verse. I knew that God just wanted me to, just to share as a point of exhortation. I didn't know when it would be. And, and this past week, I, it was like, okay, uh, it was just all week. I knew I was supposed to run with this. So um, I don't know who it's for. I know I talked to some people after the first service and man, they were like, hey, that was exactly what I needed. I'm sure that'd be the case here. Um, and those of you online, but I just believe that God's gonna use this as a, as a point of encouragement for you. Um, because I think we all need it at different times in our life when things seem so impossible and going through struggles and whether things seem good or whether things seem like they're crashing and burning right now, that, that as Christ followers, that we're, we're still, God is still on the throne. Amen? That just because we, you know, a, a troubled time goes on and issues happen, God doesn't fall off the throne and say, oh my goodness, what just happened down there? <laughs> that he's still able and still powerful and still working and still connected with you as his children. Amen? to do what he planned for your life. I love the fact that God talks about, the Bible talks about that, that he is committed to finishing the work that he has started in you. I think that's important for all of us to know. In times in my life where it's kind of like, I've always you know, looked at things and you're so like, wow, how is, you know, how is this ever going to go together? How, how am I going to recover from this? And you know, we'll go through that. Maybe you've been through things like that. And I always remind myself, come back. God, you are committed to complete the work that you started in my life. Now, that means I've got a part also with it. It doesn't mean I just sit back and eat chips and salsa watching, you know, the, the, the binge watching something. It means I've got a part. I've got a part to be in that and play in that and move in that and walk in that. But, but in, in doing that, I understand that, that, God, that you are committed to completing what you started in my life. And that I, though it seems like, Sometimes I feel like God's close. Sometimes I don't feel like he's close. I don't, you ever been that way? I mean, and I'm being totally honest. And I'm the pastor. Hello. <laughs> so I would hope that you know what I'm talking about. If not, then, then let me, you know, then I can't wait to go to your church. Amen. 
But I think every pastor I've ever read and talked talk to, we all, everybody has those seasons that you go through struggles, you go through challenges in your life and it just seems like, God, I, I know you're there, but wow, you just seem really far away. Like you kind of forgot about me over here. But the reality is he has not forgot about you. He is the God of the impossible. He is El Shaddai. He's the all-sufficient one. He's the one that meets you where you are in the middle of every situation. So, hey, let me stop talking and dive into this. In, in Numbers chapter 11, the children of Israel, uh, we see that Moses is leading them. They, they've been freed from the Egyptian bondage of slavery that they were in. Moses is leading them out toward the promised land that God has, has, has promised them, has given them. And what happens, we see that he's delivered them, God has. He's feeding them this thing called manna. It basically means, what is it? Because they had, there's no real name for it. And one of the translations I was reading, they were talking about the fact that it's like a, coriander, like a coriander seed that would be ground down and it would be used to make into like a pastry with, you know, with like an olive oil kind of thing. I said, that just kind of sounds like a croissant. I guess they just got croissants all day. I don't know. I don't, you know, it just sounded pretty good to me, you know? So I was like, I'd go with that. Croissants are good. Not good for health, but they're good, okay? But who's not counting that? But anyways, so they're compl- but they, what happens is they, they, all these things that God has done, he's, he's opened up the door, he's made an impossible move to get them out of Egypt. And now in the midst of all this crowd, and we know that in chapter 11, Moses makes a reference to over 100,000 men, and that would be men plus their families on top of that. So there's a lot of people that they're leading that, that, that are coming out of here. I mean, it's kind of one of these things you think about it, it's to even try to imagine a million plus people just migrating, you know, from here on their way to the promised land. And that's a huge task. I mean, it, and there's a point that Moses is kind of doing it all himself. And no wonder he felt like giving up and, you know, going crazy, the whole situation, because to be able to manage all that is absolutely insane. And then God changes and things begin to work a little bit different with that. But what we see is that they're here at this place and, to see just what God has done in their life. And so many times I think we, we find ourselves that we forget how blessed we are. You know, we, we, we come out of a situation, a, a bad circumstance. We come out of it and then life gets a little bit better or things get a little bit normal and kind of go through it. And then what happens is in the middle of that, we, it, we, we find ourselves that it's easy to complain. And, well, I don't have this and this isn't happening. And we forget where God has brought us from. I think anytime we forget where God has brought us from, that we, we, we open up ourselves from an op, to an opportunity to become complainers and, and begrudging over things. And you know, we, we need to, to keep the folk and understand, God, you have brought me from so much. Even in my own life, I think, I mean, I grew up in a, in, in a church all my life, but I, I look at how my life is so much different than it was before, just in my growth and who I am and even what I'm, what I'm doing, what God's worked in my life to do. And I mean, for so long, I was like, I don't, I don't have a testimony. I don't have a story. But then I started thinking about, wow, I really do. God, he's protected me from so much. He's put so much in my life. And, and what he has done, I, I need to be grateful for where he's brought me from. You need to be grateful for what he's done in your life from where you are. We never forget that. Now, they have totally forgot it. And so there's a group now in this in, in this, this group that's coming out. They start complaining. In fact, the New uh, Century Version refers to them as troublemakers. Okay. And they start complaining. What are they doing? They're like, ah, oh, we don't want manna. We're tired of manna, 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 manna. We don't want any manna. Well, you could be having no manna. <laughs> you could not be having anything to eat, okay? But God's given them this manna. It's everything they need to sustain them. And I understand, you know, I, I like a little variety in my food, you know. Um, but this is where they were. They just came out of where they were, and they're moving on to where they're supposed to be. And they're complaining about it. And they begin to say, we want meat. They're tired of man and we won't meet, okay? Um, and so it goes in verse four of chapter 11. Let's pick it up there and start reading about it. Oh, well, before I say that, the complaining part. One thing about complaining, complaining is contagious. You ever notice that? It may be, it may be been, it's happened to me, standing in a grocery store line or a checkout line in some place and someone starts complaining about the weather about how long this checkout line's taking or, oh my goodness, they're going to use a check. <laughs> Seriously, you know, because now we all got to wait for the verification, you know, whatever. And are they like, are they, that you just got to the line and checked out? You're like, oh my goodness, I have to pay. Let me find my wallet. Let me find my coins. Let me find, 
And you're like, seriously, did you not know you were going to, did you think you weren't going to have to pay for this when you got to the end of the line? I'm sorry, that's a little pet peeve of mine, okay? Some of you that, that, pastor, I'm just working on checking it through. I know, but you know you got to pay, so get that wallet out, okay? Get ready for it. It's coming, okay? The bill is always coming. All right, anyways, okay, I'll, I'll back off that. But anyways, if someone starts to complain, and what happens? You're not even a, oh, oh, I know. I, this is why there's horrible. This is, this line is crazy. The, oh, yeah, the gas prices. Oh, my goodness. And that was before they were $5, okay? And, and now it's like, now all of a sudden, you're complaining about something, and you're not even a complainer, and you just get sucked right into it. And I was reading a couple articles, you know, a couple days ago as I was kind of prepping for some of this, and it was interesting. I mean, I'm not a doctor. I don't, you know, they were, you know, some of them were, it sounded like they were, it wasn't like some, you know, crazy kind of story. They had some founding in who they were, what they were talking about. But just talking about the fact of how the aspect is that complaining actually, it only does harm to, it, it harms your relationships, it, it har but it harms you physically. And, and they were, it, 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 to, your, to your health, mental health, physical health. And they were talking about different things about that. But one, one was about even the fact they got into the aspects of your brain and the, is it the synapse? Whatever, whatever all the things inside our brains that connect all these different things together. And they were talking about is that, that when a person's complaining, it's like the, 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 they all kind of link together. Like you create a pattern of complaining, but you could also do it in, any, in anything really. But for chronic complainers, you wonder why someone just starts off and then before you know it, they're, every day they're complaining about something all the time, all the time. None of you guys. So don't be kicking anybody. Don't be poking anybody. They know it's them if it's them, okay? So, yeah, all that kind of scenario. But anyways, what they were saying that it becomes so easy that you, it just, you just complain and don't even know that you're complaining. I, I don't know about you. I've, I, in my life, I've ran into a few people like that, and I just can't be around that because it, it is contagious. It's infectious. And so as, as Christ followers, I, I think that we, we need to learn how to keep control of that. If, if that's you, to be quite honest with you, um, that's not good. Amen? It's not, it's not Jesus. Does that mean that everything's happy and good? No. I mean, you can, you can state things, but complaining goes another level. It begins to pick apart things. You know, it destroys marriages. It destroys relationships. It, it, it is destructive, and you have to be so careful because it becomes so easy to complain about everything in your life. But I think that when I, when I look back, and, and my life is... You know, my life, not just my life, my family, we, we, we've gone, there's a lot that we've gone through. And I'm so grateful that we had so much we could have complained about. And there were those times you're like, hey, God, why? Why me? I, I know none of you ever given God the why me speech, but, you know, <laughs> seriously, God? Hello? Did you, were you sleeping when all this happened? What, what's going on? You know, but then you come back and say, wait, how, you know, despite the challenges that, that we are blessed. And it, it's hard to say that, but when it becomes a habit of, of acknowledging the blessings of God in your life, that to get through when everything is going great, but also his blessings of helping you when things have just hit rock bottom, which I'm sure the majority of us in here have had that. We've hit those points where it may not be the rock bottom for somebody else, but it was the rock bottom for you. And God saw you through it. He see, he's, he's committed to complete the work that he started in your life that he's not left, you're not left alone. This is, I'm just, just not trying to say magical little words to get you all, but the reality that, that life has some really great things and then it has some really bottom yucky stuff that we hit at times. There's a lot of other words we probably could use for it, but it's like, it's bad. But God is still committed even in that to lift you out of that because he is faithful to get you there. We don't always understand why the results we get in things in our life. I don't, I go back to some of the things I've dealt with and we dealt with the loss of my wife and all those things. I, I don't have an answer as to why, but I do know what I can look at. I can look at how God sustained us, sustained, sustained her and what he did despite the final outcome. It wasn't what we wanted as a final outcome, but you know what? He sustained us and he saw us through. Even when we felt like we couldn't take another step, her and myself included, is that we were able to do that because we know that, God, you are committed to see me through from A all the way to Z. That's who you are, and he's going to see you through. And here they are. They're, they're complaining, and they're, they're, they're forgetting what they have just been brought out of. I mean, they have been in slavery. They have been whipped. 
They have been beat. They've watched their children beat. They've watched their spouses being beat. Even, I mean, they, they've, they've gone through horrific things. The punishment the Egyptians were doing upon them. And God has brought them out of there. And now they're complaining about manna. Oh, you don't like the manna. Do you forget what you just came from? It's a part of not forgetting those things. They said this. They said, they, they said, we want meat. They wanted to go to the Brazilian steakhouse and keep the green card flipped up on green. No flipping to the red. Green all the way. I want every bit of meat you got in that room. Bring it out. I'm not a huge meat eater. I, I do eat meat, but I'm not a huge one. But I have friends that do. And they can eat every cow, pig, chicken, pork, everything in that, in, back in that. Just keep, it, just keep all the little, little critters coming out because we're going to slice them and dice them and eat them up. Okay? And that's what they're like. We want meat, it says here in the New Century Version. We remember the fish we ate for free in Egypt. We also had cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions and garlic. But now we've lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. Now, again, perspective people. Hello, you, you want to say that? Yeah, you had all that, but you also had no freedom. You had all that and you were enslaved in bondage. Your family. What, what is a melon and a cucumber? I love garlic too. I love, onion. I, love all the I love all the seasoning. But you know what? It doesn't compare to freedom. And what God has in store down the road. And so verse 10 says, Moses heard every family. Talking about the contagiousness of criticism. Moses heard. Because it started off with a small group. And it says, now Moses heard every, fa every family, not just the group, every family crying as they stood in the entrances of their tent. What are they crying? We want meat. No more, no more manna. So Moses is overwhelmed of hearing the complaining, leading the, he's leading the people, trying to lead them. He's, he's overwhelmed by the whole you know, process that's going on, all this happening. And so he, what does he do? Now Moses has got the infection, the complaining infection, and he begins to compl complain to God. God's a little ticked off about it, to be quite honest. I love this part of God, okay? That was before New Testament, okay? And turn the other cheek. And so, you know, I'm just busting around about that. So don't hold me to the theology in that. But I'm just simply saying. And so, but here he is. You know, God, he's like, he's done all these things. And in verse 15, he says, um, Moses, in his complete, utter part of frustration and trying to lead the people, this is what he says, verse 15. This is the point he's dropped to. If you care about me, put me to death and then I won't have any more troubles. He's, what is he saying? Kill me now. Just God, if you love me, just kill me and put me out of my pain. That's what he's saying. This is, this is how bad this is. This is, you know, sometimes we read the stories we don't really read it. This is really bad. Everybody's falling apart in this group. Everybody, even Moses, the guy that's leading them all. And so the Lord tell, told Moses, he says, listen, okay, I want you to go back to the people and I want, to tell, I want you to tell them, tell the people that I will give them meat. I, I, not just meat for one day, for two day, five day, 10 day. He goes, no, no, I'm gonna give them meat for the whole month. And I love this little part that God, little zinger God puts in to the point that it comes out of their nose. No lie, it's there. You can look at it and see I want them so full of meat that we don't have to hear anything anymore about, I want meat, give me meat, meat, meat. You're going to be so tired of meat when I'm done feeding you meat every single day for every single meal. You won't want another bite of meat till you get to the promised land. <laughs> okay? And so then Moses, that, so, so as we continue on the journey what's taking place and then Moses reminds God, and sometimes that's what happens. When we are at a low point and we're trying to, just trying to believe that God could get me out of this. You know, how can he get me? I think it's more or less, how's he going to do this kind of thing? How's God going to turn this around? And so what happens is Moses then begins to remind the Lord. What he says, he says, well, hey, God, you know, you got like 600 something thousand men that are here, plus their families. That, that's a lot of people, you know. You, you, you just promised them meat every single day. That's a lot of meat, Okay. That's the picture of what he's saying. And he says, he reminds him of how many people he's leading. And so Moses did what many times we often do when we ask God for something. Moses is trying to figure out how God's going to do it and what he's going to have to do to make it happen himself personally. And Moses says this, if we butcher, verse 22, if we butcher all our flocks, and herds, it won't be enough. We would have to catch every fish in the ocean to fulfill your promise. So Moses is thinking, I got to help God do this. 
Because this is, in other words, God, you don't understand how many people I'm leading. This is a big test. I know you're God. I know you're big and everything, but you're going to obviously need our help to make this happen. So we're going to have to organize fishing people to go out there and fish. We're going to have to slaughter all the herds. And, you know, because there's no way you're going to be able to give a million people plus meat for 30 days. It's kind of like what we do many times is, is that we, we do the same thing. How, you know, what am I going to have to do? What part am I going to have to play in this? How am I going to have to make this happen? But I love God's response. This is the one I mentioned a couple weeks ago. In verse 23, he says this, And the Lord said to Moses, When did I become weak? When did I become weak? The other translations say it this way. It says, When did my arm become so short? In other words, what he's saying, When did my arm become so short that I can't reach you? I can't reach your pain. I can't reach your hurt, that I can't help you up, that I can't lift you up out of what you're sinking in. When did my arm, when did I become so weak and my arm so short that I can't help you in your crisis, in your situation? I want to tell you that today. When did God become so weak that he doesn't know your pain? He doesn't know your hurt. He doesn't know your problem. He doesn't know the financial avalanche you've just fallen into or your job or health or your life, your relationship. When, does God, how, you know, we're like, oh, God, how would he know about that? What is, you know, he's, you know, he's too busy. No, no, no. He says to Moses, when did I become too weak that I can't help you in this situation? So many times it's exactly the box we put God in because we short circuit what he wants to do in our life because we think that he's not big enough to take care of the situation. He's not big enough to do what it is that God, what he says he can do in his word. God is reminding Moses who he is. He's also reminding him who he's talking to. This is not just, you know, this is not your brother Aaron. This is not Joshua over there. He's like, you're talking to me. No, we're not saying that, but that's what he's saying. He said, when did I become incapable of helping you? And I love the fact that we understand that God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he did it, if he was big enough back then, he's big enough right now, and he'll be big enough for your tomorrow. He's not leaving you abandoned, even though... Moses felt like he was incapable of doing it, but God is still committed to doing and completing the task and completing the work that he started in him. God's job, even despite all the whole journey, and there was times, man, that God was like, you know, just want to fry you all and start over, you know, kind of scenario. I mean, it was, it was a, it's a long journey. It is an up and down roller coaster, but God was still committed to getting them from out of the bondage into the promised land that he called them to. And he's committed to do in your life the same exact thing from where you are now to move you through whatever the pain, whatever the struggle, whatever the hurt, whatever the hurdles to get you to where it is that God has for your life and what he's doing in your life. Despite the, the junk that we deal with and the struggles and the hurt and the pain that goes through that are part of this world and part of this life and part of the inabilities of our mind, our body to understand and to go through the things, but that God's faithfulness, and we're gonna, as we pull this together in a few moments, is, is to see that he is committed to that, to do that. You know, God is reminding Moses who he is, who he's talking to, that he's the one that freed them from the hand of Pharaoh. He's reminding him that, hey, he's the one that parted the Red Sea and in one swipe knocked out the entire Egyptian army. He's the one that did all those things. And feeding a multitude of people for 30 days meat, no big deal. In fact, if you read the story later on, what, it talks about what he actually did do. He, there's a herd of quail, a quail, quail are a small, if you're not familiar with quail, they're a small little bird. And he says that, you know, he caused a wind or something. I didn't really write that in my notes now, but a wind to come through, picks up a whole bunch of them and just dumped them. They were like three feet deep in quail. For, a, a, they said, a day's journey in every direction that you went. That The whole place was flooded with these birds all over the place, these little quail. They had the, those are those ones that had these little, like, uh, weird thing on top. They make these weird little noises. My dad took me quail hunting one time when I was young. And I was like... That's even smaller than a chicken wing. When you, get, when, you, when you go to eat it. I remember when we went to a restaurant one time, they're like, oh, it's a French restaurant. Oh, yeah, so we have these. I'm sorry, I'm not going to imitate an accent. That would be bad. Um, you know, but, you know, they just see it like it's like, well, this is this. You know, after hearing the guy talk about how great these little quail wings were going to be, and I'm thinking, wow, these are going to be filling. They come out, they're like little toothpicks, like cross, little cross toothpicks. I'm like, there used to be an old commercial, Wendy's was, where's the beef? It literally was, where's <laughs> Where's the quail? It's under the bone right there. But, but God sends them so many of them that they are completely filled, you know? And they're satisfied and taken care of because he's committed 
to see them through, even in their unbelief, which is so incredible. But Moses, you know, he's tired, he's stressed, he's, he's overwhelmed, and he just needed this snap out of it reminder that he himself was not the provider, that God is the provider. And sometimes we put ourselves in God's position thinking that we're the provider. I don't know about you. You know, I, I don't know if it's a guy thing or what, but I, you know, I've always, you know, my kids come to me with a problem or Leslie when she would have a problem. I'm the fixer. You know, I just, I just want to jump. Okay, how can, how can we fix this? How can, how can make you happy? How can make you not stop crying? I mean, no, not stop. How can make you stop crying? How can we fix these things, whatever? And, you know, I, I learned after, you know, Leslie, you know, was sick and now I'm kind of now a single parent at this point. And, and I remember, you know, even with Brittany, it, you know, she was going through life, you know, is growing. And I remember she was crying one time and I don't know if she's here. I'm getting in trouble if I say this, but you know, she's probably watching it, but you know, but I remember she was just a, a basket case. She was dealing, you know, you know, hormones and all the things that happen and girls go from little girls to women. And then she's like, ah, and she's, you know, she's like crying. I'm like, what's wrong? What can I do? What can I fix it? You know, you know what? And she's like, she, you know, I couldn't fix it. I remember her saying to me a bunch of other stuff in that conversation. She's like, dad, I don't need you to fix it. I just need you to be here. I'm like, but I don't understand. She goes, I don't need you to understand. I just need to, I need to talk to you because I have nobody else to talk to. You know, and as a dad, I'm just like, that doesn't compute with my logical brain. I don't understand this. This is like, that. I don't I, I'm going to melt down any second now. In fact, I did say to her, I'm going to step out of this room. I'm right over there. Some of you know this story, I, you know, the longer version of it. I'm going to step over there and just give you a minute just to recompose. I'm going to go recompose over there too because I totally don't understand what just happened right now. And if you need me, just call me. I'll be there. We, 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 it all worked out. I survived. She survived. You know, she's celebrating a birthday next month and, you know, she's moving ahead in life. She's good. She, you know, in it, with it, you know, so amen. Um, so good stuff. Anyways, moving in her credit a whole bit. But, but, you know, God gets you through all those things. You can't always be the fixer. You know, because sometimes it's just, I, I have to let go and let God, as they would say. Because so many times we're trying to let go and let God while we still hang on a little bit. And he's the, he is the all-sufficient one. He's the El Shaddai. He's the, the one that wants to supply your need. He's the one that can do the impossible. And yet yeah, there's a part I have to play. I'm a Christ follower. As a, as a Christ follower, I, I have to follow Jesus. You know, the church I pass pretty much every time I come here and um, they have a sign that had it for, I don't know, the last year. I'm like, you need to change that sign. That, that we're, you know, anyways, but it's, it's cute. Sounds nice what they're saying. But you know, it says, you know, um, you know, I forgot something about, we, about them welcoming everybody just like Jesus did. And I, I agree with what they're saying. It's cool. I, I, I totally agree with that. But I can't, when I see that, it just always reminds me that, you know what, that Jesus welcomes us all, but not all of us are willing to follow him. Because the welcoming is the door, but the follow is a lot different. Because some people are like, I don't think I want to do that. I don't want to, I got to, you want me to follow you through all of that? Ah, it's not really my thing. I don't want to do that. Following means that even through the struggles of life, it's, it's difficult when, when you're going through those times and it's just that you don't understand and the why, as I was saying before, all those different things. And Moses, he's, he's struggling. He, he's, he's, he literally tells God, just kill me. Put me, out of, put me out of my misery, please. I'm begging you. Just whap, knock, knock me out. But God's still working in Moses' life. He's not done with Moses yet. And Moses now is trying to be the provider that God is, he says he is. And that's kind of short-circuiting the fact that God is the all-sufficient one. And in life, many times, we do find ourselves at the point where we need that reminder that we are not God, that he is the Almighty One, and I need to let him be God, and I will follow. I'll do what I need to do. I'll follow in that. I, I love this verse, and trust him. There's this verse in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11, and it's, it's one throughout my life. I've, I've always had it and remembered it in my life, and and it talks about the fact that, you know, I'm going to read it from a different version, the new, a new century version, but it's like, well, that God sends out his word and that it will not return void, but it will accomplish that which it's sent out to do. And so this version says it this way. It says, the same thing is true of the words that I speak. This is God speaking. They will not return to me empty. They make the things happen that I want to happen, and they succeed in doing what I sent them to do. 
You say, well, okay, that's great, but what's God saying? Well, you know what? We have a whole book of what God has said. We have a book of promises that God, it's called the, it's called the Bible. And for those of you who had to be all like spissy, it's the Holy Bible. It's got one that says Holy Bible on the front. But it is God's word to us. So he said, well, God never speaks to me. Oh, he's got thousands of pages of what he spoke, he spoke and he said. Tons of promises that he's given us. And so when we read the fact that God says, I, I send my word out and it never returns back to me empty, empty, but it will accomplish that which it's sent out to do. What I say for it to do, it will do. And that doesn't mean we say, well, it didn't happen like that. Doesn't mean it's going to happen like that. Sometimes some of the stuff that God's doing in our life is going to take your entire life. You know, it's like, I, I know myself, it, you know, this, the age that I never mentioned that I am right now, um, <laughs> just because of my little denial issues. Um, but I look back when I first started pastoring. I thank God I'm not that person. See, that, that 21-year-old kid thought he knew what he was doing, but he really didn't. I knew some basics of it. I knew I was, I knew I was standing where God wanted me to stand, but... Just because you're standing where God wants you to stand doesn't mean you know it all either. And Moses is standing in the place that God wanted him to stand, and Moses doesn't know it all either yet. I mean, he, Moses evolves and grows, and you see his life changing. In your life, it's that fact that we're growing and evolving and realizing that we got God's word, and God's word in me changes me. When it talks about the fact that, that he says that when I send it out, they make the things happen that I want to happen and they succeed in doing what I send them to do. As you and I take the, the, the time, and I, I think it's so important, I, I, going this, this year is, is, is moving quickly. Thank God. Get, out, get, get us out of this weather right now. I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't know. That's one thing I'm done with. I'm done with cold, okay? That's what, you know, I used to love snow and skiing. I'm just, let's just, get, let's just skip, let's skip to the good part, okay? <laughs> Spring, summer, let's skip to that part, all right? Anyways, it is. We live in New Jersey. What do we expect? So in that understanding in, is, is the fact, let me totally forgot what I was saying. Oh, man, I hate when that happens. Uh, oh, the fact is we, we get God's word into our life. And I know I, I'm so grateful that I'm not that 21-year-old kid who thought he knew what he was doing. But, but as God's word continued to pour in my life about, about who I was and what I'm doing, I'm not the same person that I was. I can, I can deal with people that were difficult people now way different than I did back then. Listen, pastor, you're saying there's people in church difficult? Yeah, I'm saying that. There's difficult people in the grocery store. There's difficult people in, the, in your office. There's difficult people in your house. Hello. You got people, you got difficult people. I don't care who they are. Your little group of friends, there's one or two that are difficult in your group of friends. There's always a different, difficult one in them. It's just, it's just how it kind of works, you know? So... Yeah, but as you grow, you can, you can love difficult people. You can work with difficult people. You can help difficult people not become so difficult anymore as the love of Jesus becomes a part of their life. And so when Jesus, when, when God talks about his word coming, going out, when it comes to us, as we take the time, I think it's so critical, said, as this year moves faster, is the fact is that don't, let's not lose this year by not taking, we gotta stop and make sure that we're taking time to methodically and, and strategically Put God's word every week within our life, if not every single day. We need to deposit his word because the more God's word is deposited into our life, the more we get in it. And, and listen, don't start with the, well, pastor, I tried reading it and, you know, so-and-so begot, so-and-so begot. Well, I don't, what is a begot? I don't even know what a begot is, you know. You know, so-and-so gave, gave birth in that situation. But get a translation that you can read. Get a translation that you understand to study that's going to be easy for you to understand, whether it's in your, in your native language or whether it's in, you know, the terminology of how we talk today. And I know there's some people probably watching and maybe somebody in here, you're like, no, bless God, the only Bible, the Bible that Jesus used was the King James Bible, and that's the only Bible for me. I actually had someone tell me that. You do know that Jesus did not have a Bible. I had someone argue with me one time, difficult people. No, no, Jesus used the king. I'm like, he didn't even speak English. <laughs> Hello, are you kidding me? That's like King James English. We don't even speak King James English. <laughs> Ye over yonder, I, 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 can't, even, I can't even replicate it. I, I used to could joke about it. I can't even do it. It doesn't make any sense to me. But get a translation that you can read that you, when you read it, it comes alive to you and you understand it. 
And let it be something that you do because you need God's word in your life. Because when you do, God's word will not return void. It will change. It will transform your heart, your mind, your spirit. It'll change you. But it can't change you looking pretty on a shelf or in an app or close up. It, it, it can't change you. It has to go in you. You need to get it in here and in your heart and, and it will not return void. It will accomplish, as God said, his word will accomplish what it was sent out to do. I've seen God's word. I've seen his promises succeed. When, when the doctors went to my father, when I was eight years old and my brother was born and he went to my dad because they had to ship him to, you know, he, they, they did an emergency thing. I've told this story, some of you know this, but those of you who don't, he had to, we lived in western Pennsylvania. They had to rush him to Youngstown, Ohio, to a children's hospital. It was there and hook him up with all these things. He had a, um, it was called highline membrane disease. I know they use it in different terminology now, but, but you know, back then the, the, the survival rate was very, was a lot lower than it is now. And he died. He died there. And the doctor telling him, I'm sorry, your, your, your son has died. Just to have shortly after that, he comes back to life. Well, he had half of Canada praying for him, half the United States praying for him, and all our family all around were praying for him. You know, he's just an infant. He was just born, a newborn. And then they were like, well, and I, hey, nothing against the doctors. They're just dealing with what they're dealing with. And they're, thank God for doctors. Half of us wouldn't even be here if we didn't have doctors. Amen. So the Christians that sit there and make fun of doctors, I'm like, you better stop that. <laughs> That's stupid. You, you, we need doctors. Doctors are good. And uh, anyways, and they said, look, we, he, he hasn't had oxygen for quite a bit here. I don't, I don't remember the time span, but they're like, you know, we don't know brain-wise how he's going to be because he's going to, obviously there's going to be a lot of damage because he's been lack of oxygen for a while. And they got him back up and he was in the hospital, I don't know, it was a month, I think, or more that he was in, in, in Ohio, a whole other state and finally came home and, and you know, grew up. And I remember when, when we were here, um, we had moved to here uh, when, he was, when he was younger and um, I remember going to school and they did like a test on him and he was like a grade, at least a grade above his level when the doctors had thought he would never be anywhere up above anything because of the damage that they suspected would have happened to him because of being dead, lack of oxygen. As I always tell this joke, which I think is always benefiting as an older brother, I debate some of that. <laughs> we'll leave it at that point, but, but no, seriously. But God's word changes and transforms us. And, you know, and to be honest with you, if there was, any, if there was anything there, the prayers of my mom, my dad over him, God's healing power working in his life, changing him. It's a complete, utter miracle from start to finish. You know, um, when I started pastoring this church, I successfully almost destroyed every bit of it. It went down from two services down to like nothing, basically. But I knew God had still called me, but his word in my life changed me. And help me become a better pastor and, you know, move forward. And people that he surrounded me with that, you know, I, it's, I think it's always important, you know, as, as a pastor, I've always, I, when I understood the fact that you can't be everything, you don't know everything. And, and you, you know, where I was weak, God put people that had strengths that I didn't have. So I could be strong where I was strong, but where I was weak, he puts other people around you. Some, sometimes you can't get to where you need to be because you won't let anybody get close because you're going to be the, you have to be the God of the situation. The all in all. No, only he is the all sufficient one. You have weaknesses. And to be able, whether it's your spouse, people in your life, to be able to come around you to help you be strong in the places that you are weak, that is so vital. Because you're not, we're meant to be a body. The body of Christ means that some of us are strong in some things, but weak in a lot of other things. But where we're, where we're weak, there are others to be strong. Does that make sense? That that's how we are strong in our families, in our life. And, and so, you know, I've, I've seen that myself over how God did that. When, um, when we, when Leslie and I were getting married, and I know I mentioned this the other week, when we were getting married and there was a housing market, um, you know, shortage. We couldn't find an apartment and our, it was like six months away from getting married and we were like, we can't find a place. And you had to put applications in and they were saying it's going to take six to eight months to hear back. And I'm like, where are we going to live? I, I, love my, I love my future in-laws, but I don't want to live with them. And she loved my mom, but she didn't want to live. I understand it. If you have to, you have to. You do what you got to do. But, and so anyways, we were going through all that. And it was like, what do we do? And, and I remember every day we made it a point. We just prayed. So, okay, God, I thank you. You have this. I thank you that you know our need. We don't know what it is, but we know that you're going to supply our need because you are in control of this. 
And every day we prayed. Every day we thanked him that he was opening door. He was leading us to the right thing that we were doing. And so, you know what? And then, as some of you know the story, and a guy came up to us and said, hey, you know, Pastor, God told me that you're supposed to buy my, our condominium. And I'm thinking, I don't, first, I don't know what your condominium looks like. Okay. Secondly, we ain't got any money. So that's a little bit of a problem. Okay. I didn't tell him that. And I said, well, you know, we'll, 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 you know, we'll, say, we'll pray about it. You, 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 come on. We've all said that, you know. Oh, yeah, we'll pray about it. And because I get home and I told Leslie, I was like, then again, we were talking this was before we were married. And so I was like, I was like, yeah, I don't know. You know, he wants, he said that God told him, but I don't know about, maybe, maybe God was a little missing this one because we, we don't have any money. We, I don't, we're trying to figure out how to pay for the wedding. I don't know how we're going to do this. And, and then like the following week or the week after, he came in and he says, you know what? And so, as I said, some of you know the story, but for those of you who don't, just to show that, that God, when he does something, he can really do stuff that you never, ever expect. And he walked in and he said, you know what? This is the weirdest thing. He said, I was praying and, you know, God just told me that he wants to, that I'm supposed to give you the down payment. That was $20,000 he gave us. I've never had anybody give that, please. It's like, and I was like, and listen, it wasn't, well, you're the pastor. No, it, had a, it was no pastor thing. It was a God thing. Because I'm a child of God, you're a child of God. And you know what? He knew our need. And every day, every day we were speaking his word over our, our future marriage. Every day that we were praying over that, God, you are supplying every need that we have, God. Because we didn't have the money. And, you know, and God, that, and I think I said this one time before, but that gentleman, when he did that, that, the door that that opened up for our life, I am so grateful for that. Because it's, it's that first step to get to buy something, to own something. It's so incredibly, it was hard then. It's even more harder now. Don't lose hope because God is able to open up the door and somehow, some way to do something in your life. So if you're praying for that, you're holding, don't give up because I was blown away by that. That was an impossibility for us. But God did that. And we, yeah, we, so we bought a condo, condo right off of this street down in Woodbridge, right past Main Street. This condo right by the turnpike. Beautiful two bedroom, two bath. Couldn't ask for more. I was like, wow, we were shocked at it. God did that. And that's not because I'm a pastor. Not because I have some special little phone in the back somewhere. Hey, God, I need a, I need a bargain, guys. <laughs> it's because just like you, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm, I'm a Christ follower. And he knows my need. And you know, and there's been other times that it didn't happen like that. Actually, that's never happened after that. But you know what? I'm so grateful it happened that one time. Amen? So I'm like, yeah, God, I appreciate that. But God has no respecter of persons either. And so and for people say, well, pastor, that's because, you know, you're, you grew up in... No, forget all that, that stuff. I'm no different than you. I have no special, I have no special accolades that God's going to favor me. No, no, we're, we're, we're equal together. And he's faithful because he's committed to complete the work in your life. I went way over my time, didn't even get as far as I got in the last service, but El Shaddai is the name that God introduces himself to when he comes to Abraham. At 99 years of age, God promised him and his wife Sarah, she's about 90 at that point, promises them a child. And it had been a long time, 24 years from the promise to the time that this son is actually born. It's a long time to wait and not hear anything, not know anything. God comes up and he, he speaks to Abraham and he, he basically what he does, he reintroduces himself to Abraham by using the terminology. He says to them, I am almighty God, or what is in Hebrew would be El Shaddai. El Shaddai meaning, it's mentioned over 48 times in the Old Testament. It's the name that reveals the covenant of God to us. It's God in, in the Old Testament used names to reveal his character to people in the situations that they were in. So if you needed healing, he would reveal himself as the Lord God, your healer, because that's what you need healing. Our peace, you know, Jehovah Shalom, he, the peace, that's who he is. When you need peace, if you need peace, you don't, it's not, you're not trying to get your mortgage paid. You need peace. I need to get my, I need some peace to even to get through the next day. Amen. Or Jehovah Jireh, the Lord God, your provider, when you, when you are in need in your life. And so he introduces himself in all these things. And he comes to Abraham and he goes, he goes my name is El Shaddai, the, the all-sufficient one, the almighty God. And the picture of this word El Shaddai, it's, this, it's El meaning the strong one, the life giver, the mighty and powerful one. And, and Shad, and I know it's kind of debated back and forth, but it can really tie in both a mountain or the strength of that, but also is referred to, as many scholars point out and bring out, is the fact of the, the breasted one. 
And that seems weird to us in a culture, but basically when you think about it, a nursing mother, a baby that can't do, cannot do anything on its own. It can't walk yet, it can't talk, it can't ask for any need. Totally incapable of doing anything but just eating and pooping. That's it. And this is the example that God uses. He goes, I'm, I am, in this terminology, understanding I'm the breasted one. In other words, as a mother feeds and nurses the child, the child grows. All the nutrients that are in the mother's body goes into that child. The child grows, becomes healthy, becomes strong, uh, tolerant to different diseases and things like that, you know, from that, that nursing mother. And it's this picture that God's saying, when you are completely helpless, which he was, he's 99 years old, by, about 100. His body is dead to being able to even help, like, trigger a child to be born at this point, okay? Sarah's womb is barren. There, it's a mess. But they're still holding on to the promise that God, you said you're going to give us a son. And it looks completely impossible. And God says, I want you to introduce myself. I'm El Shaddai. Because the situation they need, they, needed nur they need nourishment. They needed life. They needed rejuvenation. They needed to know that despite the age, that God is still able to meet you in the midst of your situation and where you are and do above and beyond. The mighty one to nourish and satisfy, to pour out his provision because he's the all-powerful one. The ancient rabbis referred to him as, uh, as the all-sufficient one. So here, a hundred-year-old man whose body is as good as dead, who is still holding on to the promise that he was given to have a baby with his 90-year-old wife, God introduces himself and says, I'm your nourisher. I'm your strength giver. I'm more than enough. And your Isaac is on the way. And he says to you today, just as he did in Leviticus over and over again, he reminds the people that I am the God that brought you out of the land of Egypt because we need to remember what God has done to help maintain this strength while we're waiting for the promise to come. And that's not easy. And all through Leviticus, God keeps telling them, I am the God that brought you out of Egypt. Don't forget that because I did that then. I can do this. It's the same thing that enabled a young teenager named David to stand before Goliath, a, a, a seasoned warrior, and stand there and know that God, this guy is pretty big, pretty bad, and pretty mean, and way more than I am, but God, you're bigger than this. Just use me. And he does. And he wants to do that in our life. When you're tempted to believe that God has forgotten you, that he can't rescue, that he can't provide for you, he can't turn this around, he wants to reintroduce himself to you, that he is El Shaddai. He wants to remember all that he's done before for you and that he is still committed to completing the work that he started in your life. And that's, just listen. Yes, amen. That's who he is. And that's not just to try to make you feel good. It's who he is. I've seen it. I've lived it. So many of you have lived it. I've walked through your stories. I've heard your stories. I mean, you've, you've been through it too, and you saw God. Never forget those things. And that's why your testimony is so important, your story, because it encourages other people to know that, hey, I've been there. I, I, I'm with you. You're going to come through this. Why? Because he did it to me, and he's no respecter of persons. He's going to do it for you. Because that's the God that we serve. El Shaddai the all-sufficient one, the almighty one. Amen? Father, I thank you today. You know every need in here. You know every need of every person watching today. Lord, I just ask that you just meet them right now in their heart and let them know that they know that they know that you are with them. You're still walking with them. You haven't forgotten them. Just like, just like you didn't forget Abraham and Sarah, though it may have seemed like that you totally forgot them to them, but then you come up and you remind them who you are. And that you're committed to see them through. And you do. You see them through. And Father, you're going to do the same to the people here today. Whatever situations they're in, you're with them. Your strength, your comfort, your peace, your hope. Your word in their life builds them. Let them just begin to saturate their life with your word so that they can stand before every giant that comes in their life and know that they know that they know that you are faithful. And no matter what has happened, you are still with them and you're going to walk them through because you are committed to complete the work that you've started in their life. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, love you guys. If you need prayer, our team would love to pray with you. Have an amazing week. We'll see you next Sunday. Thank you.